Welcome to Scripture Insights. I'm Taylor Halverson. Thanks for joining us. I'm Mike Harris. Today we'll be discussing 3 Nephi chapter 17 through 19. Now, Jesus has given all these instructions. It's been a tremendous experience for the people at the temple in Bountiful. And he says to them in verse 2, I perceive ye are weak, that ye cannot understand all my words which I am commanded of the Father to speak unto you at this time. Therefore, go ye into your houses and ponder upon the things which I have said, and take the time to be prepared. Now, this is a great learning principle. Uh, learning is a bit like consuming a meal. Like if you consumed a Thanksgiving meal every, every day, it would be a little overwhelming. You need to take things in bite-sized chunks, metaphorically speaking, and give yourself the time to process what you've been experiencing. Jesus gets that. He understands that people cannot understand every last piece of information that he delivers to them. And yet, he also is filled with compassion because as he realizes, when he sees their reaction, in verse 5, they were in tears and did look steadfastly upon him as if they would ask him to tarry a little longer with them. And he said unto them, Behold, my bowels are filled with compassion towards you. Now, again, that's not a phrase we use in our language today, but the bowels or the womb in the ancient world was considered the place of security and nourishment. And so he's feeling the sense of, I want to provide ongoing nourishment and security to them. So he has them bring forward all the people who are in need of healing. He says, have ye any that are sick among you? Bring them hither. Have ye any that are lame, or blind, or halt, or maimed, or leprous, or that are withered, or that are deaf, or that are afflicted in any manner? Bring them hither, and I will heal them, for I have compassion upon you. My bowels are filled with mercy. I was talking with my wife recently about this verse, and kind of brought her to tears a bit. My wife lost her hearing a few years ago and had to get cochlear implants, which is helpful, but uh, technically she's deaf, although she gets hearing with her cochlears, not like normal hearing. And she also has had some foot problems. I think she had like 11 foot surgeries over a couple of years and spent over about six months basically in bed waiting for her feet to heal. And she reads this and she's like, yeah, I feel maimed and lame and I'm deaf and I, look forward to the healing of the resurrection when my body will be whole. And when Jesus does healings, it is meant to be forward-looking to what the kingdom of God is like. When we are all in God's future heavenly kingdom, there will be none of these problems. Everything and everybody will be whole. So Jesus, to give people a taste of what the heavenly kingdom is like, does these healings as a witness for what to look forward to. I like here in verse five, Taylor, how it says that the people were looking steadfastly upon Jesus. And that same phrase is found in 3 Nephi 11, when Jesus appears, they did look steadfastly towards heaven. I wonder if that is a good reminder to us in order to fully experience Jesus Christ's power in our lives, we can't be casual or half-hearted about it. It requires some intentional uh, focus mm-hmm. on him and devotion towards him. And so and that, that leads to these great miracles. Yeah, the word steadfast, you could use the word stand strong because stead means to stand and fast means to be strong. So they're standing strong or they are committed or focused or very purposeful. They're not being wishy-washy about it. It's interesting that they they didn't verbally ask him to stay longer, but it says that they were in tears and were, oh yeah, verse five, as if they would ask him to tarry a little longer. It kind of reminds me on that first Easter morning, uh, well, it would have been later on in the afternoon, the road to Emmaus, after they walked about seven miles and had a Q&A with Jesus. They didn't realize it was Jesus. And then they get to the house and Jesus acts as if he's going to keep going. Hmm. But then 
they asked him to stay longer mm -hmm. and then they go and have a sacrament like experience and then their eyes are open and then they realize that they had been with Jesus the whole time. Uh, same on the Sea of Galilee. Jesus was going to keep walking by, but then they cried out and they asked. There's just something about asking. I wonder how many times we maybe miss out on amazing blessings that he's willing to give us if we will just simply ask. Some blessings he's going to give us regardless. He gives even the wicked blessings. I get that. But there's just something so simple and yet so powerful with the idea of asking Jesus to tarry. As you were talking, it gave me this idea that they ask him to tarry, just like in the road to Emmaus, where they then get a sacrament experience. We're going to see a sacrament experience coming up here too as well, which again is an emblem of his death and resurrection and of his presence always abiding with us if we remember him. So this is a this is just a helpful reminder that we should seek to ask God to tarry in our lives. And I would add that <clears throat> 3 Nephi 17 also kind of reminds me of the prayer roll in the temple. He tells them that you need to bring them. We need to bring the names of those that we're concerned about that are sick or afflicted in any manner, not just physically, but spiritually, so that Jesus can, can hear, heal them. So this is a great reminder as you're reading the scriptures, looking for Jesus and looking for temple connections to help both the scriptures and the temple to make more sense and to be much more uh, meaningful. And of course, we hear in verse 9 that all these people were healed because of their faith. And then he commands, in verse 11, they bring, should bring forth their little children. Jesus stood in their midst. And it came to pass, everyone sits down, and Jesus groans within himself, verse 14. Father, I am troubled because of the wickedness of the people of the house of Israel. And then he, he himself knelt on the earth, he prayed unto the Father, and after this manner do they bear record about what he said. The eye hath never seen, neither hath the ear heard before so great and marvelous things as we saw and heard Jesus speak unto the Father. That would have just been phenomenal. I know, for example, I love listening to the prayers of people that I admire or that I think are faithful or spiritual, but imagine hearing Jesus himself mm. pray to the Father. And verse 18, he arose, so great was the joy of the multitude that they were overcome. But he bids them to arise, and he says, Blessed are you because of your faith, and now behold, my joy is full. And I don't mean to read too much into this, but I think, well, I thought your joy would have already been full, right? You're the son of God. You've been resurrected. And then you get this verse 21. When he said these words, he wept. And the multitude bear record of it. And he took their little children one by one and blessed them and prayed unto the Father for them. And when he had done this, he wept again. We don't have a lot of passages of Jesus weeping. We have Jesus wept on behalf of Lazarus before he was resurrected or uh, restored from the grave. We have the story of God weeping over the wickedness of uh, mankind. We see that in the book of Moses, in the Enoch story. And then here, I don't know of any other passages, and here it's twice that he's, he weeps. And I'm guessing from the context that this is weeping out of joy, whereas the two other contexts, the one of Enoch and the one of Lazarus, He's weeping out of sorrow in the story of Enoch, sorrow for the wickedness. Mm -hmm. And the story of Lazarus, he's weeping over empathy. Mm -hmm. I think he's weeping because his friends are so sad that their brother and their friend has passed on. But this is all centered on he weeps, he's with the children, he weeps. That the one by one with the children is bound by his joyful weeping where he has fullness of joy. And many of us are adults here, but we're also all little children in the eyes of God. And he wants mm -hmm. us all one by one to be blessed of him. It's interesting that after, again, if this is, I love how Jack Welch has done a lot of good work on this. If this is really a temple covenant context situation, after each of the children get prayed over and blessed one by one, it's interesting 
at the end. There it says in verse 23, Jesus says to the parents, Behold your little ones. What would give Jesus any more? That would be the fulfillment of his joy to bind families together for time and all eternity. And then verse 24, angels descend and people are encircled as if with fire. And it's interesting the number of times, it's not a lot, but the consistent pattern we see in the Book of Mormon of angels of the Holy Spirit attending people and they are enveloped by this grace-filled, salvific fire. And then we get this accounting from Mormon that it was about 2,500 souls of men, women, and children. So about the size of a full-fledged stake of the church. And that's quite a lot of people. At the same time, it's a very small group of people considering the number of people that actually exist out there. But these people were privileged to be part of that experience. As we move into chapter 18, Jesus introduces the sacrament. So in past episodes, we talked about how Jesus focused on, this is my doctrine, and he teaches baptism. I find it significant that after the emphasis on baptism, the very next ordinance that is discussed uh, repeatedly here is a sacrament. So let's spend just a bit talking about that experience that the people had with Jesus. So he asked them to bring forth bread and wine. So some go to get the bread and wine. And when it's received, he breaks it and blesses it. And he commands them they should eat. It says in verse 5, when they were eaten and were filled, when they had eaten and were filled, he said unto his disciples, Behold, there should one be ordained among you, and to him will I give power that he shall break bread and bless it and give it unto the people of my church, unto all those who believe and be baptized in my name. And this shall ye always observe to do, even as I have done, even as I have broken bread and blessed it and given it unto you. And this ye do in remembrance of my body. And it shall be a testimony unto the Father that ye do always remember me. And if you do always remember me, ye shall have my spirit to be with you. So what does Jesus want? He knows that he's about to leave at some point in the near future. He wants that the people always have access to his spirit. And the sacrament covenant is the ordinance that empowers that after baptism and the gift of the reception of the Holy Ghost. Now, as a reminder, sacrament Jesus initiated at the last Passover supper he had with his disciples. The Passover meal was instituted in Exodus when God saved the people out of bondage. And it was celebrated, and actually still this day by Jews, every year as a reminder that God's great goodness and mercy is always available to the faithful, that he will take them out of bondage and bring them into deliverance. So when we partake of the sacrament, we should be thinking about all the great things God has done to deliver us. And we could be thinking back, beginning to Exodus, when God saved the Israelites out of Egyptian bondage, or any story from the Book of Mormon where people were delivered, or that were delivered from death and hell, those twin monsters, and we are redeemed by the blood of Jesus Christ, which was in part what Jesus was doing. He was, at his Last Supper, he was updating the meaning of the Passover service to say, really, the point here is to focus on me as the deliverer. So every week, we are asked to remember that God is the deliverer. And that as we remember that, we will have his delivering spirit be pervasively with us. For me, one word jumps out. Well, two words in verse 2. Jesus commanded that the multitude should sit. It's that seems to, and I'm just kind of talking out loud here, but it seems to me that it's a holy invitation to sit at the feet of Jesus. Let's slow down and let's learn from him as we, I mean, the, the bread and the wine, the bread and the water symbolizing his body. This is a, it's like a, almost a funeral service, but now he's resurrected. This is definitely a time to slow down and learn from him 
as he teaches us. As you were talking, it gave me this thought that uh, in the business world, I've heard people talking about trying to have more effective and faster meetings. So they do stand-up meetings. Because when people are standing, there's a sense that of movement, like we're going to get out of here, mm-hmm. and of like proactive, uh, let's conclude this meeting. But when you sit, when you're sit, you're 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 taking more time to be more deliberate. And what you've pointed out here is that when we sit down, we are in a state of hopefully greater focus and attention where we know that we are committing significant time to a cause. Whereas if you're standing, it only takes one step to get yourself out of that situation. You can move on out. That's a good insight. So then he introduces the wine and drinking of the wine. Again, in verse 10, this is about fulfilling the commandments the Father has given as a witness unto the Father that you're willing to do that which I've commanded you. Remember, commandments are the stipulations for fidelity and faithfulness within a covenantal context. And he says, And this ye shall always do to those who repent and are baptized in my name, and ye shall do it in remembrance of my blood, which I have shed for you, that you may witness unto the Father that you do always remember me. And if you do always remember me, ye shall have my spirit to be with you. And notice in verse 13 it says, Verse 12, first, he says, always do these things, and if you do these, you'll be blessed and be built upon my rock. Verse 13, but whoso among you shall do more or less than these are not built upon my rock. So, sacrament is the most repeated ordinance that I know of in the church. It's weekly, and we don't try to do more or less than that. We don't try to make it a fancy affair. We don't try to diminish the ritual, or the ordinance. And it's simply about remembering Jesus Christ and that he is our deliverer. He repeats again in verse 14, Blessed are ye if ye ye shall keep my commandments. And how do we keep the commandments? Every week we pledge to remember remember him and to keep the commandments. And so it's really helpful that God has this cadence on a weekly basis to keep us in remembrance of what we've committed to in a covenantal relationship. Verse 15, Verily, verily, I say unto you, ye must watch and pray always, lest ye be tempted. Which, again, echoes what Jesus instructed the apostles when he was in the Garden of Gethsemane, too. And it's in Matthew 26, verse 41. Watch and pray that ye enter not in temptation. So, yeah, the, the sacrament seems to be almost in a way, a recreation of the Garden of Gethsemane. Verse 18 is interesting as well. There's an interesting phrase. Uh, The Lord says you must watch and pray always, like we talked about in verse 15, lest you you enter into temptation. And here's the new phrase, for Satan desireth to have you. That's the same phrase that Jesus used uh, on that Thursday night before going into Gethsemane when he warned Peter. Right. But I also think it's interesting. It's the same phrase that Jesus used when he tried to warn Cain of his anger problem and that was going to lead to killing his um, his brother Abel. I, I just I love the fact that Jesus Christ shows that same love and concern that he gave to his chief apostle, Peter, and he's giving to these faithful Nephite disciples, he even showed that towards Cain. In fact, showing that is one of the themes of this chapter is Jesus is the exemplar. In fact, he says multiple times about the light. Let's look at verse 16, verse 24. He says, behold, I am the light. I have set an example for you, right? He has shown you how to do sacraments. Down in verse 24, hold up your light that it may shine unto the world. Behold, I am the light which ye shall hold up. Verse 25, I have commanded that none of you should go away, but rather have commanded that you should come unto me, that you might feel and see. Even so, ye, so, even so shall ye do unto the world. The idea here is that he is inviting everybody to the sacrament table and that nobody should be uh, withheld from participating in church services, including sacrament, unless they have been deemed er- 
unworthy by appropriate authorities. He makes it really clear here, verse 28, ye shall not suffer anyone knowingly to partake of my flesh and blood unworthily when ye shall minister it. Nevertheless, if somebody is unworthy for partaking in the sacrament, you shall not cast him out from among you. That's verse 30. The idea is that Jesus wants everybody at his holy supper table. We've said this before, and it's, I think it's worth repeating, that in the ancient world, uh, people did not have meals with whom they were at war with or they were enemies with. You would have meals or a table fellowship with whom you had a sacred or a long-standing covenantal relationship. So when God asks us to the sacrament table, he's saying, I'm not at war with you. I don't see you as an enemy. I see that we're in a covenant relationship. Therefore, confirm that we truly are by partaking of this holy meal that I've prepared for you. In fact, I haven't sacrificed any animals to make it happen. I've just sacrificed myself to be able to provide all the sustenance you need. I wonder if there's something to that first Easter when, you know, Peter had had a rough uh, 24, 48 hours earlier, right? He, he told Jesus he would go to prison, he would die for him. And yet when Jesus gets arrested, the 12 scatter, right? And then Peter denies knowing Jesus three times. And, but then that Easter morning, Jesus appears to him and they think he's a ghost and they touch his hands and everything. But then Jesus asked them, do you have anything to eat? Is it because he's hungry? Maybe he wants to renew this table fellowship. I want to, mm. Peter, you've had a rough, you've had a rough week, mm. but I want to assure you that the covenant is still in place. Let's ratify it. And they gave him honeycomb and fish, I believe, and they, mm. they shared this meal. That would have been encouraging to Peter. And I think it should be encouraging to us that we we're invited back to the table to sit down and break bread with him, renewing that covenant. Yeah, and it's every week. That's uh, plenty of time. I mean, it's frequent enough for us to not easily forget how God's mercy is always available for us. So Jesus gives regula regulations about how to uh, maintain order in the church. You should not cast anybody out. Uh, unworthily, people should not be partaking the sacrament unworthily, but um, if somebody will not repent, verse 31, they shouldn't be numbered among the members of the church, but nevertheless, you shall not cast him out of your places of worship. Verse 32, continue to minister to them. And he says, I give you commandment, verse 34, I give you these commandments because of the disputations which have been among you, and blessed are ye if you have no disputations among you. So he's trying to provide order, that's through ordinances, in the church. The doctrine is straightforward. The order or the ordinances guide our experience of the doctrine. And once he had uh, established this order, he touches the disciples with his hand in verse 36. And later, uh, Mormon identifies what had happened is they were granted through the priesthood the power to give the Holy Ghost. And then verse 38 and 39, the conclusion of the first day of Jesus' experience with the people of Nephi, of Nephi. It came to pass when Jesus had touched them all, there came a cloud and overshadowed the multitude, and they could not see that they could not see Jesus. And while they were overshadowed, he departed from them and ascended into heaven. And the disciples saw and did bear record that he ascended again into heaven. So Jesus said he's going to come back. So imagine you've already had a really long day, emotional, spiritual, and yet. A large group of people, beginning in verse 2 and 3, they go spread the news all around the land. Come and see Jesus returning all night long, which again is amazing to me because the next day they're going to be pretty exhausted. They had energy drinks or something. Yeah, I guess they had the Spirit of God. The inspiration gave them the power. So a great number of people did labor exceedingly. This is verse 3. All that night that they might be on the morrow in the place where Jesus should show himself unto the multitude. I love that because all of us as members of church are laboring in some capacity in our families, in our communities, in the church, serving, laboring exceedingly to kind of bring people to know that Jesus is going to return and we should be ready for that. Then we have a listing of all these 12 disciples that he chosen, all their names. And each of these then divided the they divided the group into 12, 
uh, the group of the Nephites, and they taught what Jesus taught. And it says essentially nothing wavering. They just only taught the basics of what Jesus taught. They didn't add to or take away as Jesus had said. And then they asked everyone to pray. I think it's interesting that they had the multitude nil, verse 6, nil down. In fact, you might think, well, I could pray anytime. I could be at work, at school, whatever. I could be in my car and I could pray. And that's true. But there's also something about taking time to kneel. In fact, it's so significant back in chapter 18, Jesus himself did kneel down. And Jesus Christ felt that reverence to the need to kneel. There, we should, there should be times where we slow down and we have these kneeling prayers. It's interesting, the Hebrew word for kneeling and knee is related to the same word for blessing, that you receive blessings when you're in a state of humility or a state of kneeling and supplication. Hmm. And as we learn about their prayers down in verse 9, they did pray for that which they most desired, and they desired that the Holy Ghost should be given unto them. And they went down into the waters, they were baptized, Nephi does the baptisms, and it came to pass in verse 13, they were all baptized, and it come up out of the water, the Holy Ghost did fall upon them, and they were filled with the Holy Ghost and with fire. Notice how often angels and the Holy Ghost and fire are paired terms in mm. scriptures. And behold, they were circled about as if it were by fire, and it came down from heaven, and the multitude did witness it, and did bear record, and angels did come down out of heaven and minister unto them. And it came to pass that while the angels were ministering unto the disciples, behold, Jesus came and stood in the midst and ministered unto them. So Jesus is also a type of an angel. He's an angel or a messenger of the covenant. Angels are messengers of the covenant, and they are there to teach the word of Christ, which are the words that lead us back into the presence of God the Father. Now, as we go down to verses 19, 20, 21, and so forth, we hear a recorded prayer of Jesus Christ. And listen to what he says. And just listen to the, just the humility and the love that's embedded in the words of Jesus as he prays to the Father. Father, I thank thee that thou hast given the Holy Ghost unto these whom I have chosen. And that'd be the twelve. Yes, that's right. And I'm Not glad just you, the multitude, right? I'm glad you pointed that out because when I emphasized in verse 13, they were all baptized. We're talking about the twelve disciples and I, I'd forgotten to identify that. Because later the whole multitude will eventually be baptized, but right now it's just these 12 disciples who've been chosen. It is because of their belief in me that I've chosen them out of the world. Father, I pray thee that thou wilt give the Holy Ghost unto all them that shall believe in their word. So the multitude and everybody beyond. Father, thou hast given them the Holy Ghost because they believe in me. And thou seest that they believe in me because thou hearest them. And they pray unto me and they pray unto me because I am with them. And now, Father, I pray unto thee for them, and also for all those who shall believe on their words, that they may believe in me, that I may be in them as thou, Father, art in me, that we may be one. This sounds like the intercessory prayer in John, I forget the chapter, like 14, 15, 16, 17. Yeah, John 17 is uh, where Jesus is offering that incredible prayer and notice how it says in verse 24, they did not multiply many words. Now, if you have a long prayer and you have a lot you need to talk about, I don't think God has a problem, but we've all seen situations where people feel like they need to use a lot of flowery language and they need to use big fancy vocabulary and all sorts of intonation and to, to convince God that he should hear them. And yet prayers can be very simple and straightforward and just come from the profundity of our hearts. And then I love this phrase. The word smile does not show up a lot in Scripture, but it shows up twice in this chapter, where Jesus blessed them, in verse 25, as they did pray unto him, and his countenance did smile upon them. And the light of his countenance did shine upon them. You see that did smile upon them in verse 30 as well. And the idea is, when God's love shines upon us, just know, He's smiling. When you feel God's spirit, he is smiling. Again, it's not a word that shows up a lot, 
But the way it's ordered here leads us to conclude that the, when his countenance is smiling, it's shining upon us. And it's, notice that they are white as the countenance and the garments of Jesus. And the whiteness was beyond any whiteness that they'd ever seen. And again, whiteness here is more probably glory and 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 just the essence of God's goodness. And that continues on even into verse 30, where it says they were white, even as Jesus. And this white seems to be this symbol of purity or godliness and an, an emblem that you are part of God's kingdom and have his full blessings and spirit with you when you become fully white. I think it would be helpful for our listeners to consider, if you're into marking your scriptures, this would be really helpful to go through Jesus's prayer here, starting in verse 20, and the conclusion is uh, verse, well, maybe around to 31 or 30. Every time you come across the, a pronoun they or them, mm -hmm. in one caller, mark every time it refers to the multitude, and in a different color when it refers to the 12. And I think you'll see some interesting and important messages emerge. Like just one example, look at verse 28. Father, I thank thee that thou hast purified those. Mm -hmm. That's not the whole multitude, at least not yet. That's referring to the 12 whom I have chosen because of their faith, the 12. And I pray for them, the 12, and also for them, that's the multitude or anyone who shall believe on their words, the 12, that they may be purified in me. That, that's an interesting message there. If we want, to, I think we all yearn to feel more sanctified, purified, cleansed from sin. Listen to the 12. You would think he would say, I would hope that they would listen to my words. I'm right here, flesh and bones, which certainly you'll be blessed. But again, back to 35 chapter 12, verse 2, more blessed are those that will listen to the words of the 12. Not only will it increase your faith, there's something about listening to their words that purifies us. In that belief or faith or trust of listening to God's chosen prophets is highlighted symbolically, I think, as he concludes here at the end of the chapter, uh, came to pass that when Jesus had made an end of praying, he came again to the disciples and said unto them, So great faith have I never seen among all the Jews, wherefore I could not show unto them so great miracles because of their unbelief. Verily I say unto you, there are none of them that have seen so great things as ye have seen, neither have they heard so great things as ye have heard. I think this is an invitation that not only should we be hearing directly from Jesus himself, but we should be hearing him and believing on those words from his chosen servants. And when we do, we have the same opportunity, so great miracles, and that we will see so mm. great things. And as we do these things, our hearts, our minds will be uplifted. We will find healing in our souls, in our relationships, and we will find ourselves at peace in the kingdom of God. And we leave this with you in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen.